Disc 39, Snuff By Terry Pratchett Audiobook 8x24 Yet it wasn't the stink although heavens knew that they stank with all the stinks an organ an organic creature could generate no, anyone who walked the streets of Ankh-Morpork was more or less immune to stinks, and indeed there was now a flourishing, if that was the word, hobby of stink collecting, 13 and Dave, of Dave's Pin and Stamp Emporium, was extending the sign over his shop again. You couldn't bottle, or whatever it was the collectors did, the intrinsic smell of a goblin because it wasn't so much a stink as a sensation, the sensation in fact that your dental enamel was evaporating and any armor you might have was rusting at some speed. Vims punched at the thing but it hung on with arms and legs together, screaming in what was theoretically a voice, but sounded like a bag of walnuts being jumped on. And yet it wasn't attacking unless you considered the biological warfare. It clung with its legs and waved its arms, and Vims just managed to stop Feeney braining it with his official truncheon, because, once you paid attention, the goblin was using words, and the words were Ice. Ice. We want just ice. Demand. Demand just ice. Right? Just ice. Feeney, on the other hand, was shouting, Stinky, you little devil, I told you what I'd do to you if ever I saw you stealing the pig's will again. He looked at Vims as if for support. They can give you horrible diseases, sir. Will you stop dancing around with that damn weapon, boy? Vims looked down at the goblin now struggling in his grasp, and said, As for you, you little bugger, stop your racket. The little room went silent, apart from the dying strains of they eat their own babies, from Feeney and Just Ice, from the goblin, simply and accurately named as Stinky. Not panicking now. The goblin pointed a claw at Vims's left wrist, looked him in the face, and said, Just ice. It was a plea. The claw tugged at his leg. Just ice. The creature hobbled to the door and looked up at the glowering chief constable and then turned to Vims with an expression that bored into the man's face and said very deliberately, Just ice. Mr. Policeman. Vims pulled out his snuff box. You could say this for the brown stuff. All that ceremony you went through before you took a pinch gave you rather more thinking time than lighting a cigar. It also got people's attention. He said, Well now, Chief Constable, here is somebody asking you for justice. What are you going to do about it? Feeney looked uncertain, and took refuge in a certainty. It's a stinking goblin. Do you often see them around the lockup? said Vims, keeping his tone mild. Only stinky, said Feeney, glowering at the goblin, who stuck out his worm-like tongue. He's always hanging around. The rest of them know what happens if they're caught thieving around here. Vims glanced down at the goblin and recognized a badly set broken leg when he saw one. He turned the snuff box over and over in his hands and did not look at the young man. But surely a policeman wonders what has happened for a wretched thing like this to walk right up to the law and risk being maimed, again. It was a leap in the dark, but, hell, he had leapt so often that the dark was a trampoline. His arm itched. He tried to ignore it, but just for a moment there was a dripping cave in front of him, and no other thought except of terrible endless vengeance. He blinked and the goblin was tugging at his sleeve again and Feeney was getting angry. I didn't do that. I didn't see it done. But you know it happens, yes. And again Vims remembered the darkness and the thirst for vengeance, in fact vengeance itself made sapient and hungry. And the little bugger had touched him on that arm. It all came back, and he wished that it hadn't, because while all coppers must have a bit of villain in them, no copper should walk around with a piece of demon as a tattoo. Feeney had lost his anger now, because he was frightened. Bishop Scour says they're demonic and insolent creations made as a mockery of mankind, he said. 
I don't know about any bishops, said Vims, but something is going on here and I can feel the tingle, felt it on the day I came here, and it's tingling on my land. Listen to me, Chief Constable. When you apprehend the suspect you should take the trouble to ask them if they did it, and if they say no you must ask them if they can prove their innocence. Got it? You're supposed to ask. Understand? And my answers are, in order, hell no and hell yes. The little clawed hand scratched at Vim's shirt again. Just ice. Vim's thought, oh well. I thought I'd been gentle with the lad up until now. Chief Constable, something is wrong, and you know that something is wrong, and you are all alone, so you'd better enlist the help of anyone you know that can be trusted. Such as me, for example, in which case I'll be the suspect who, having been bailed on my own recognizance of one penny, and here Vim's handed a partly corroded small copper disc to the astonished Feeney has been requested to help you with your inquiries, such as they are, and that will be all fine and dandy and in accordance with the standard work on police procedure, which, my lad, was written by me, and you had better believe it. I'm not the law, no policeman is the law. A policeman is just a man, but when he wakes up in the morning it is the law that is his alarm clock. I've been nice and kind to you up until now. But did you really think I was going to be spending the night in a pig pen? Time to be a real copper, lad. Do the right thing and fudge the paperwork afterwards, like I do. Vims looked down at the persistent little goblin. Okay, stinky, lead the way. But my old mum is just coming out with your dinner, commander. Feeney's voice was a wail, and Vims hesitated. It didn't do to upset an old mum. It was time to let the duke out. Vims never normally bowed to anybody, but he bowed to Mistress Upshot, who almost dropped her tray in ecstatic confusion. I am mortified, my dear Mistress Upshot, to have to ask you to keep your man dog suck po warm for us for a little while, because your son here, a credit to his uniform and to his parents, has asked me to assist him in an errand of considerable importance, which can only be entrusted to a young man with integrity, as your lad here. As the woman very nearly melted in pride and happiness Vims pulled the young man away. Sir, the dish was bang suck duck. We only have man dog suck po on Sundays. With mashed carrots. Vims turned back and shook MRS up shot warmly by the hand, and said, I look forward to tasting it later, my dear Mistress Upshot, but if you'll excuse me, your son is a stickler for his police work, as I'm sure you know. Colonel Charles Augustus Makepeace had long ago, with the expertise of a lifelong strategist, decided to let Letitia have her way in all things. It saved so much trouble and left him able to potter around in his garden, take care of his dragons and occasionally go trout fishing a pastime that he loved. He rented half a mile of stream, but was sadly now finding it difficult to keep running fast enough. Nowadays he spent a lot of time in his library, working on the second volume of his memoirs, keeping from under his wife's feet and not getting involved. Until this moment he had been quite happy that she had the role of chairman of the magistrates because it kept her away from home for hours at a time. He had never been very much of a one for thinking in terms of good or bad and guilty or not guilty. He had learned to think in terms of us and them and dead and not dead. And therefore he wasn't exactly listening to the group sitting around the long table at the other end of the library, talking in worried voices, but nevertheless he couldn't help overhearing. She had signed that damned document. He ought to have tried to talk her out of it, but he knew where that would have ended. Commander Vims. Okay, by all accounts the man was the sort to rush in, and maybe he did have a scrap with Watchis Nam the blacksmith, who wasn't too bad a cove in his way, bit of a hothead of course but he'd made a damn good dragon prod only the other day at quite a reasonable price. Vims? Not a killer, surely. 
That's one thing you learned in the military. You don't last long if you're a killer. Killing as duty called was another thing entirely. Letitia had listened to that unspeakable lawyer and they had all agreed that it be signed simply because that wretched rust fella wanted it. He opened this month's edition of Fang and Fire. Occasionally somebody lowered their voice, which you couldn't help thinking was damn insulting, given that they were sitting in a chap's library and especially when the chap hadn't been consulted. But he didn't protest. He had long ago learned not to protest, and so he kept his eyes focused on the pull-out feature on flame-retardant incubators, holding it in front of him as if to ward off evil. However, among the words he didn't hear were, of course, he only married her for her money, you know. That was his wife's voice. Then, I heard she was desperate to find a husband. The curiously sharp tone of that voice identified its owner as Miss Pickings, who, the colonel couldn't help noting, as he stared grimly at a full-page advertisement for asbestos kennels, had clearly been in no hurry to find a husband herself. The colonel was, by inclination, a live-and-let-live live personality and, frankly, if a gel wanted to go around with another gel who wore a shirt and tie, trained horses and had a face like a bulldog licking vinegar off a thistle, then it was entirely her business. After all, he told himself, what about old Beefy Jackson, eh? Wore a dress every night in the mess and rather flowery aftershave for a chap, but when the call to arms came he could fight like a bloody demon. Funny old world. He tried to find his place on the page again, but was interrupted by the very Reverend Mauser. He never could get on with Padres, couldn't see the point. I find it very suspicious that the Ramkin family have turned up here after so many years, don't you? I keep reading about Vims in the newspaper, not the kind of person you can imagine as simply taking a holiday. According to Gravid, he is known as Veterinary's Terrier, said Letitia. At the other end of the room her husband thrust his head even deeper into his magazine so as not to snigger. Gravid. Who would call their child Gravid? No one who had ever kept dragons or fish, that was certain. Of course, there was such a thing as a dictionary, but then the old Lord Rust had never been the kind of man to open a book if he could help it. The colonel tried to contemplate an article on the treatment of zigzag throat in older males and the wife of his heart continued, Well, we don't want any of veterinary's nonsense here. Apparently, his lordship rather enjoys allowing Vims to break wind in the halls of the mighty. Apparently, Vims is no respecter of rank. Indeed, quite the reverse. And indeed, it would seem that he is prepared to ambush a decent working man. Funny, thought the colonel, first time I ever heard her call the smith anything other than a blasted nuisance. It seemed to him that the gossip around the table was trite, artificial, like the conversation of raw recruits on the eve of their first battle. He thought, there's a warrant out for Commander Vims, hero of Cum Valley, bloody good show. Wonderful execution. Peace in our time between Brother Troll and Brother Dwarf and that sort of thing. Just the job. I've seen too much killing in my time, and now you are going to put him out of a job and a reputation, just because that greasy lad with a name like a pregnant frog has charmed you into doing so. I understand he has a very violent nature, said, oh, what was his name? Bit of a bad hat in the colonel's opinion. Bought a big villa up near Overhang, one of Rust's cronies. Never seemed to do any work. What was his name? Ah yes, Edgehill, not a man that you would trust behind you or in front of you, but they'd sworn him in even so. And he was just a street kid and a drunkard, said Letitia. What do you think of that? The colonel paid careful attention to his magazine while his unspoken thoughts said, Sounds jolly good to me, my dear. All I got when I married you was the promise of a half share in your dad's fish and chip shop when I left the service, and I never even got that. 
Everybody knows that his ancestor killed a king, so I can't imagine a Vims would jib at killing a blacksmith, said the Honorable Ambrose. Bit of a mystery, this one. Something to do with shipping. Sent out from the city to lie low here because of something to do with a girl. And the colonel, who spent a lot of time thinking, 14 had some time ago wondered to himself how, in these modern days, you got banished from the city because of a girl, an instinct had told him that possibly it had something to do with the age of the girl. After incubating that thought for a while, the colonel had written to his old chum Yanka Urs Robinson, who always knew a thing or two about this and that and one thing and another and was now some political walla in the palace. He had made an inquiry, as one might, of his friend whom he had once dragged to safety over the pommel of his saddle before a clachin scimitar got him, and had received a little note with nothing more than an yes indeed, underage, hushed up at great expense, and after that the colonel had taken great care never to shake the bastard's hand again. Blithely unaware of the thoughts of the colonel, the Honorable Ambrose, who always seemed to be slightly bigger than his clothes said clothes being of a fashion more suited to somebody twenty years his junior sneered, Frankly, I think we're doing the world a service. They say that he favors dwarfs and all kinds of low life. You might expect anything of a man like that. Yes, you might, thought the colonel. And Miss Pickings said, but we haven't done anything wrong. Have we? The colonel turned a page and smoothed it down with military exactitude. He thought, well, you all condone smuggling when the right people are doing it because they're chums, and when they aren't they're heavily fined. You apply one law for the poor and none for the rich, my dear, because the poor are such a nuisance. He felt eyes suddenly upon him because marital telepathy is a terrible thing. His wife said, it doesn't do any harm, everybody does it. Her head swung round again as her husband turned the page, his eyes fixedly on the type as he thought, as noiselessly as his brain could contrive. And of course there was the, incident, a few years ago. Not good, that. Not good. Not good when little babies of any sort are taken away from mothers. Not good at all. And you all know it and it worries you, and well it should. The room was silent for a moment and then MRS Colonel continued. There will not be any problems. Young Lord Rust has promised me. We have rights, after all. I blame that wretched blacksmith, said Miss Pickings. He keeps bringing it back into people's memories, him and that damn writing woman. MRS Colonel bridled at this. I have no idea what you're talking about, Miss Pickings. Legally nothing wrong has happened here. Her head swiveled towards her husband. Are you all right, dear, she demanded. For a moment he looked as though he wasn't and then the colonel said, Oh, yes, dear. Right as rain. Right as rain. But his thoughts continued. You have partaken in what is. I strongly suggest, a cynical attempt to ruin the career of a very good man. I heard you coughing. It sounded like an accusation. Oh, just a bit of dust or something, dear, right as rain. Right as rain. And then he slammed his magazine onto the table. Standing up, he said, when I was nothing but a subaltern, dear. One of the first things I learned was that you never give away your position by frantic firing. I think I know the type of your commander Vims. Young Lord Rust may be safe, with his money and contacts, but I doubt very much that you all will be. Who knows what would have happened if you hadn't been so hasty. What's a bit of smuggling? You've just pulled the dragon's tail and made him angry. When his wife regained control of her tongue, she said, How dare you, Charles? Oh, quite easily, as it turns out, dear, said the colonel, smiling happily. A bit of smuggling might be considered a peccadillo, but not when you're supposed to be upholding the law. 
It baffles me that none of you seems to realize that. If you have any sense, ladies and gentlemen, you will explain that whole unfortunate goblin event to His Grace right now. After all, your chum Gravid organized it. The only little problem is that you allowed him to do it, as I recall, without so much as a murmur. But it was not illegal, said his wife icily. Her husband didn't move, but in some ineffable sense he was suddenly taller. I think things got a bit tangled. You see, you thought about things as being legal or illegal. Well, I'm just a soldier and never was a very good one, but it's my opinion you were so worried about legal and illegal that you never stopped to think about whether it was right or wrong. And now, if you will excuse me, I'm going down to the pub. Automatically, his wife said, No, dear, you know drink doesn't agree with you. The colonel was all smiles. This evening I intend to settle my differences with drink and make it my friend. The rest of the magistrates looked at MRS Colonel, who glared at her husband. I'll talk to you about this later, Charles, she growled. To her surprise, his smile did not change. Yes, dear, I suspect you will, but I think you'll find that I won't be listening. Good evening to you all. There was a click as the door shut behind him. There should have been a slam, but some doors never quite understand the situation. The goblin was already moving quite fast with a dot and carry one gate that was deceptively speedy. Vims was surprised to find that Feeney made heavy weather of the little jog towards he was not surprised Hangman's Hill. He could hear the boy wheezing slightly. Perhaps you didn't need to be all that fast to overtake a wayward pig, but you needed to be very fast indeed to catch up with a young troll blizzard to the eyeballs with slice and you needed lots of stamina to overtake him and slap the cuffs on him before he came down enough to try to twist your head off. Policing was obviously very different in the country. In the country, there is always somebody watching you, he thought as they sped along. Well, there was always somebody watching you in the city, too, but that was generally in the hope that you might drop dead and they could run off with your wallet. They were never interested. But here he thought he could feel many eyes on him. Maybe they belonged to squirrels or badgers or whatever the damn things were that Vims heard at night time, gorillas, possibly. He had no idea what he was going to see, but certainly didn't expect to find the top of the hill bright with lines of rope, painted yellow. He gave it only a second's glance, however. With their backs to one of the trees, and looking very apprehensive, were three goblins. One of them stood up thus bringing its head and therefore its eyes to a level in the vicinity of Vimsa's groin, not a good position to find himself. It held up a wrinkled hand and said, Vims. Hang. Vims stared down at it and then at Feeney. What does he mean, hang? Never been quite sure, said Feeney. Something like, have a nice day, I think, only in Goblin. Vims. The old goblin continued. It said be, you be policeman. It be big policeman. If policeman, then just ice. But just ice it be no. And when dark inside dark. Dark moving. Dark must come, Vims. Dark rises. Just ice. Vims had no idea of the sex of the speaker, or even its age. Dress wasn't a clue. Goblins apparently wore anything that could be tied on. Its companions were watching him unblinkingly. They had stone axes, flint, vicious stuff, but it lost its edge after a couple of blows, which was no consolation when you were bleeding from the neck. He had heard that they were berserk fighters, too. Oh, and what was the other thing people said? Ah yes. Whatever you do, don't let them scratch you. You want justice, do you? Justice for what? The goblin speaker stared at him and said, Come with me, policeman, the words rolling out like a curse, 
or, at least, a threat. The speaker turned and began to walk solemnly down the far side of the hill. The other three goblins, including the one known to Vims as Stinky, did not move. Feeney whispered, This could be a trap, sir. Vims rolled his eyes and sneered, You think so, do you? I thought it was probably an invitation to a magical show featuring the amazing Bonko and Doris and the collapsing Unicycle Brothers with Fido the Cat. What's this yellow rope all about, Mr. Upshot? Police cordon, sir. My mum knitted it for me. Oh yes, I can see she's managed to work the word plice in black in there several times, too. Yes, sir, sorry about the spelling, sir, said Feeney, clearly spooked by the stairs. He went on, there was blood all over the ground, sir. So I scraped some into a clean jam jar, just in case. Vims paid that no attention, because the two goblin guards had unfolded and were standing up. Stinky beckoned Vims to walk ahead of them. Vims shook his head, folded his arms and turned to Feeney. Let me tell you what you thought, Mr. Upshot. You acted on information received, didn't you? And you heard that the blacksmith and I indulged in a bout of fisticuffs outside the pub yesterday, and that is true. No doubt you were also told that at some time later someone heard a conversation in which he arranged to meet me up at this place, yes? Don't bother to answer, I can see it in your face you haven't quite got the copper's deadpan yet. Has Mr. Jefferson gone missing? Feeney gave up. Yes. Mr. Vims. He didn't deserve, or perhaps he did deserve, the force with which Vims turned on him. You will not call me Mr. Vims, lad, you ain't earned the right. You call me sir or commander, or even your grace if you are dumb enough to do so, understand? I could have sent the blacksmith home walking very strangely if I'd had a mind to do so yesterday. He's a big man but no street hero. But I let him get the steam out of his tubes and calm down without losing face. Yes, he did say he wanted to meet me up here last night. When I came up here, with a witness, there was blood on the ground which I will warrant is goblin blood, and certainly no sign of any blacksmith. You had a bloody stupid case against me when you came up to my house and it's still a bloody stupid case. Any questions? Feeney looked down at his feet. No, sir, sorry, sir. Good, I'm glad. Think of this as a training experience, my lad, and it won't cost you a penny. Now, these goblins seem to want us to follow them and I intend to do so, and I also intend that you will come with me, understood. Vims looked at Stinky and the two goblin guards. An axe was waved in a half-hearted sort of way indicating that they should indeed be traveling. They set off and he could hear sorrowful Feeney trying to be brave, but broadcasting anxiety. They're not going to touch us, kid, first because if they had intended to do that they'd have done it already, and second, they want something from me. Feeney moved a little closer. And what would that be, sir? Justice, said Vims. And I think I have a premonition about what that is going to mean, sometimes people asked Commander Vims why Sergeant Colon and Corporal Nobs were still on the strength, such as it was, of the modern Ankh-Morpork City Watch, given that Nobby occasionally had to be held upside down and shaken to reclaim small items belonging to other people, while Fred Colon had actually cultivated the ability to walk his beat with his eyes closed, and end up, still snoring, back at Pseudopolis Yard. Sometimes with graffiti on his breastplate. To Lord Veterinary, Commander Vims had put forward three defenses. The first was that both of them had an enviable knowledge of the city and its inhabitants, official and otherwise, that rivaled Vims's own. The second was the traditional urinary argument. It was better to have them inside pissing out than outside pissing in. It was at least easy to keep an eye on them. And not least, 
Oh my word not least, they were lucky. Many a crime had been solved because of things that had fallen on them, tried to kill them, tripped one of them up, been found floating in their lunch, and in one case had tried to lay its eggs up Nobby's nose. And so it was that, today, whatever god or other force it might be that regarded them as its playthings directed their steps to the corner of Cheapside and Rhyme Street, and the fragrant emporium of Bewilder Force Gumption. Fifteen Sergeant Colon and Corporal Nobs, as is the way with policemen, entered the building by the back door and were greeted by Mr. Gumption with that happy but somewhat glassy smile with which a trader greets an old acquaintance who he knows will end up getting merchandise with a discount of 100%. Why, Fred, how nice to see you again, he said, while awakening the mystic third eye developed by all small shopkeepers, especially those who see Nobby Nobs coming into the shop. We were patrolling in the area, Bewilder Force, and I thought I'd drop in to get my tobacco and see how you were managing, with all this fuss about the tax and everything. The sergeant had to speak up to be heard above the rumbling of the snuff mill, and the carts that were moving across the factory floor in a stream. Lines of women at tables were packing snuff and here, he leaned sideways to get a better view the cigarette production line was also a bustle. Sergeant Cullen looked around. Policemen always look, on the basis that there is always something to see. Of course, sometimes they may find it sensible to forget that they have seen anything, at least officially. Mr. Gumption had a new tie pin, in which a diamond flashed. His shoes were also clearly new bespoke, if Fred Cullen was any judge and a barely noticeable sniff suggested the wearing of, let's see now. Oh yes, Cedar Fragrance Poor Homs, from Cormet AM $15 a pop. He said, how's business doing? Is the new tax hitting you at all? Mr. Gumption's visage flew into the expression of a hard-working man sorely pressed by the machinations of politics and fate. He shook his head sadly. We're barely making ends meet, Fred. Lucky to break even at the end of the day. Oh, and a gold tooth, too, thought Sergeant Cullen. I nearly missed that. Out loud he said, I'm very sorry to hear that, bewilder force, I really am. Allow me to raise your profits by expending two dollars in the purchase of my usual three ounces of twist tobacco. Fred Cullen proffered his wallet and Mr. Gumption, with a scolding noise, waved it away. It was a ritual as old as merchants and policemen, and it allowed the world to keep on turning. He cut a length of tobacco from the coil on the marble counter, wrapped it quickly and expertly, and as an afterthought reached down and came up with a large cigar, which he handed to the sergeant. Try one of these handsome smokes, Fred, just in, not local, made on the plantation for our valued customers. No no. My pleasure, I insist, he added, as Fred made grateful noises. Always nice to see the watch in here, you know that. Actually, Mr. Gumption thought, as he watched the departing policeman, that was pretty mild. All that the knobs creature had done was stare around. They must be coining it, said Nobby Knobs as they ambled onwards. Did you see the staff wanted note in their window? and he was writing out a list of prices on the counter. He's lowering them. He must have a good deal going on with the plantation people, that's all I can say. Sergeant Colin sniffed the big fat cigar, the fattest he had ever seen, which smelled so good it was probably illegal, and he felt the tingle, the feeling that he had walked into something that was a lot bigger than it seemed, the feeling that if you pulled a thread something large would unravel. He rolled the cigar between his fingers the way he had seen connoisseurs do. In truth, Sergeant Colin was, when it came to tobacco products, something of a bottom feeder, cheapness being the overriding consideration, and the protocol of cigars was unfamiliar to a man who very much enjoyed a good length of chewing tobacco. What was the other thing he had seen posh types do? Oh yes, 
you had to roll it in your fingers and hold it up to your ear. He had no idea why this had to be done, but he did it anyway. And swore. And dropped it on the ground. The track from the top of Hangman's Hill went beyond the trees and down, mostly through firs bushes and rocky outcrops, with the occasional patch of raw and useless soil, all substance eroded away. Wild land, wasteland, home to skinny rabbits, hopeless mice, the occasional concussed rat, and goblins. And there among the bushes was the entrance to a cave. A human would have to bend double to get into that fetid hole and would be an easy target. But Vims knew, as he ducked through, that he was safe. He knew that. He had suspected it out in the daylight, and down in the darkness he knew. The knowledge was almost physical as wings of darkness spread over him, and he heard the sounds of the cave, every sound. He suddenly knew the cave, all the way down to the place where water could be found, the fungus and mushroom gardens, the pathetically empty storerooms, and the kitchen. These were human translations, of course. Goblins generally ate where they could and slept where they fell asleep, they had no real concept of a room with one particular purpose. He knew this now as if he had known it all his life, and he had never before been in any place that a goblin would call home. But this was the dark, and Vims and the dark had an understanding, didn't they? At least, that's what the dark thought. What Vims thought, unprosaically, was damn, here we go again. He was prodded in the small of his back, and he heard Feeny gasp. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.